Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, where we help new and beginning teachers navigate through those crazy first years of teaching so you can maintain your sanity and personal life. Here's your host, Kim LaPree. Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, episode number 20. Hey, thanks for hanging out with me today. I'm your host, Kim LaPree, and this is the podcast for new and beginning teachers who don't want to just survive those first few years, but actually thrive. Today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about mindset and whether you have the right mindset to hack it as a new teacher. Now, I know that this might sound a little bit negative, like, oh, am I good enough to be a teacher? But that's not my intent. Here's the thing. We all know that teaching is hard. There's the low pay. There's the lack of respect from many people in the general public, the lack of resources and money. There's a lot of really unreasonable expectations put upon us. You're going to have rude parents and disrespectful students and so much more. And so the reason why I feel that you need to have the right mindset is how are you going to survive all of those things for, you know, 30 plus years if you don't? And if after this conversation, you realize that, oh, maybe I don't have the right mindset, it doesn't mean that you should give up. It does mean that maybe you need to rethink certain things and work them out so that you're going to move forward and be more successful and happy as a teacher. So again, I don't want you to sit there and wonder if you just wasted all your money on getting your teaching credential, or if you're in the middle of your pre-service education, I don't want you to ask yourself if you should drop out. But I do want you to sort of think about these different questions that I'm going to ask you and how they apply to you. And then I'm also going to tell you why they're important and give you some real life um, scenarios. So the first question I want you to ask yourself is whether or not you're a blamer. And how do you know if you're a blamer? So think back, it could be far, far back or recent. Think back at a time when something happened to you that was negative, that was unfair, that still leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Now, without overthinking, was it anyone's fault? And if so, whose fault was it? Who was the reason why it ended up? This way. Now, if you can easily point the finger at a bunch of people, then you're a blamer. If you in no way take responsibility for what happened, you're a blamer. And what if you're like, well, it wasn't my fault. My dog passed away. And that's understandable. That's different. But if it's somewhere where you feel that you were wronged and it's not fair, it wasn't my fault, we have to ask ourselves, what role did we play? that made it turn out that way. So here is a real life example. So as I mentioned in the beginning, teaching is really, really hard. And there's going to be a lot of obstacles, especially in your first few years of teaching. And you're going to have students who aren't succeeding like you want them to. You're going to have parents who aren't happy with the job that you're doing, or other colleagues who are somehow begrudging something that you did or said. And It's easy to blame other people for these things and become cynical and negative down the road. So sometimes teachers, when their students aren't behaving in their class, they blame the parents. They blame technology. There's a lot of things that they blame other than taking a look at themselves. And notice I didn't say blame themselves. We don't want to blame ourselves, but we want to look at how do we contribute to the outcome? So even if, let's say that's, you know, there was a fight and someone really got hurt and you're like, well, it wasn't my fault. I wasn't in the fight. But if you are a bystander and you just watched it happen and you didn't use your teacher voice to break it up, you contributed to that outcome. And in the same way, if students are not performing well in your class, don't blame yourself, but ask yourself, what could I have done? Or what did I not do, which caused this end result? So maybe you only sort of covered one concept and you went really, really fast and you didn't make sure that they really understood it before you moved on. That's normal, especially because when we're starting out teaching, we're not really sure about our pacing. 
And then sometimes teachers will blame the lack of support in terms of why their students are not achieving success. And at the same time, we should be asking ourselves, did we ask for help? Did we seek it out? Yes, we may have a mentor, but that mentor is teaching as well. So did we ask our colleagues, our department members for help and let them know that we're struggling? Another blame that I hear a lot is teachers blaming students for being unmotivated. And this one, I kind of don't agree with. I mean, yes, you can have students who don't like your subject, who don't like you and are unmotivated. But let's be honest, you probably know someone whose students really shine no matter what their level is, and they seem excited to go to class and they do the work and you wonder what is going on there. So I think a lot of it isn't blaming the students for lack of motivation, but then we have to ask ourselves, are we being motivating? You know, it's not our job to be entertainers per se, but are you delivering your lessons in a way that is interesting and motivating to the age group in front of you? So if I were to drone on like the teacher on Ferris Bueller's Day Off and do that in front of a a group of middle school students, they are going to get antsy. They are going to zone out. They are going to act up because that is the reality of that age group. And I can't expect anything else from them if all I do is stand at the front of the room and be the talking head and maybe not even let them work together in groups or, you know, reprimand every student for even looking the wrong way, that is definitely a recipe for an unruly classroom. So these teachers who are saying it's the kids and they're unmotivated, I challenge them to ask themselves, have they looked at the way that they're delivering the content? And could that also contribute to the students not being motivated? Along the same lines, I also hear a lot of blaming administration. So I've heard complaints from teachers who say, you know what, somehow I always end up with the lowest students, the worst behaved students, the bottom of the barrel student, and it's not fair. And so if you're listening, raise your hand if you've heard teachers complain about that, because that is actually a common complaint that I've heard at multiple schools from multiple teachers complaining that somehow they ended up with these students. Now this particular line of thinking, this mindset really bothers me for a few reasons. Number one, I think it's really offensive. Just because a student isn't a high achiever, I wouldn't call them bottom of the barrel or somehow lump them in a group of not worthy students because they're low or because they misbehave. Look, you got into teaching because you want to work with students and you have a love and a passion for education and you know you're signing up for every single learner. So you can't sit there and lump them all together if they're not the perfect learner. So that's one thing that bothers me is that mindset about these particular students. Number two, these same people also think that other people are gifted with great students and that's why those students perform well or behave well or get their work done. And as someone who has students who tend to perform well, and they're motivated, and they love coming to my class, and they get work done, it's a little bit offensive that the assumption is that the reason why my class is so good is because I'm gifted with these awesome students. And it totally discounts or disregards the fact that I make it a point to be a teacher who is motivating, who is engaging, who students love to be around. And so they're just basically discounting my skill as a teacher. Like, no, it's not because you're a good teacher. It's because somehow you ended up with the good students. So that part bothers me as well. In addition, when you really think about it, students come and go. And so I hear a lot of, you know, students aren't like they used to be, or this class is really blah, 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 blah. And you know what? They're right. Students are different today. They have different sets of challenges. They have a lot of social pressure from social media, and they do have a lot of distractions. So then my question for these teachers is, why are you digging in your heels? Why are you standing still while things are progressing and changing around you? So if the kids nowadays are truly changing and they are different, then are you changing with them? 
Are you the talking head in the front of the room? Are you giving worksheets? Are you giving multiple choice tests? Are you giving zeros for late work? And expecting that it's going to be the same as it was back in the day. Because if you are doing those things, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. And for you listeners out there, I'm sure you see this happening all around you. So the next question is, do you have thick skin? And oh, this is so important. Now, I'm sure that you were inspired by your teachers or you watched some movie or a TED Talk and it totally inspired you to be a teacher. You're ready to change the world and you know that you have a gift with kids. And then you're in your classroom and someone throws, you know, a wadded up piece of paper at your head. Kids talk to each other across the room. They slouch in their seats. They yawn loudly during your lesson. They get up and walk across the room to go get a tissue or throw something away without asking for your permission. They completely ignore you. I could go on and on about these behaviors, but the question is, how are you going to deal with that? Now, I know that classroom management is a huge, huge obstacle for a lot of new teachers because we've heard about all of these different techniques, but until you're actually in front of the kids, even with your student teaching experience, it can be really hard to implement in an impactful way. So I've seen classroom management work a couple different ways for new teachers. So on the one hand, you have the teachers who try to be overly nurturing and friendly and almost trying to be the student's friends and They let a lot of things slip through because, oh, this student has a really hard home life or, oh, I need to give this one extra love. And then on the flip side, you have the teacher who decides they're going to come in with an iron fist and they're going to have all of these rules and they're going to have, you know, demerits or they're going to have a timeout space. They get red and flustered when the kids talk out of turn and they yell at the kids in front of the whole class. These are two extremes and neither of them work, honestly. But a lot of times what motivates us to utilize one of these techniques is fear of losing control of our classroom. And it's that frustration in the moment when things aren't going as you want them to that we sort of default to something extreme. So as a new teacher or someone who is wanting to be a teacher, you need to ask yourself if you have thick skin. Are you going to be able to handle all of these microaggressions that you experience and feel throughout the day and still deliver your content? Now, some teachers will say, well, you know, we're not robots. We have feelings and we can't just sit there and and take it every single time. But you're a professional here. You need to be able to handle it in a professional way to maintain composure in front of these students and not let them get to you. Now, on the flip side, we also don't want to cave into their demands and become their friend because in the end, we know that they're not going to respect us. So you have to have this balance of, can I push aside the opinions and comments of an adolescent or teenager and be confident in myself while also not being this overly strict dictator in the classroom who uses fear and punishment and humiliation to get order and to get the kids to comply. Now for this next one, I sort of alluded to this earlier in terms of the talking head, but a question to ask yourself is, do you like the sound of kids' voices more than your own? So I know that a lot of teachers come into the field having majored in something else, and they were thinking, you know what, I'm this expert in this area, and that means that I should teach it. So they envision themselves sort of professor-like standing at the front of the room and just lecturing and lecturing while kids dutifully take notes and take their tests and just revel in the learning and the topic. But that's not really the reality. If you're someone who loves to lecture and loves to hear yourself talk, I don't necessarily think you're going to enjoy teaching because kids don't like to sit and listen to someone talk at them for an unlimited amount of time. Kids really have short attention spans. And in fact, adults have short attention spans. 
But if your hope is to just sit there and be a lecturer, then you might want to rethink one of two things. Either rethink your intentions to teach in a K-12 environment or rethink the way that you're going to deliver lessons. So you still could be really passionate about teaching your subject, like you just absolutely love biology and you want to spread this love for biology to your students. And that's awesome. But the delivery is so important. And it's not just me talking while you take notes. It's engagement and interaction, and especially in science, doing experiments. It's just part of that magic in teaching where you actually get to see the learning happen, not through just multiple choice tests, but through students interacting with the information. And there are a lot of well-intentioned teachers who are experts in their field who think that just because they're an expert, it's going to make them a good teacher. And that's not necessarily true. I hate to break it to you because I've seen this in the field before. So again, I don't want to discourage you from becoming a teacher. I just want you to think about your intentions and how you had planned to deliver your lessons. I'm hoping that in your credentialing program, your pre-service programs, that they're teaching you about being more interactive and engaging with your students. But if in the back of your mind, you just wanted to stand and have the whiteboard be your security blanket and just stand up there the whole time while the students did work on their own, I really think you're going to struggle as a teacher. Also, I want you to think about your ability to change. When was the last time someone was able to truly change your mind or way of thinking? And the reason why I bring this up is because the way that you think about teaching, the way you think about students, and just your mindset in general when it comes to education will change so much throughout your career. There are a lot of misconceptions that I had when I started out teaching, and they're very, very different now. Some of them have to do with grading, with the way that I deliver my lessons, the way that I interact with students and, and how I try to see things through their eyes and allow them to also teach me. Also, this mindset has to do with being coachable. You need to be coachable to survive as a teacher because you don't know everything and you're not going to know everything. I've been teaching for 17 years at the time of this podcast and I still have so much to learn in terms of my teaching. So if you're someone who it's really hard to change your mind about something, you're really stubborn and you really dig your heels in, it's going to be a little bit tougher for you than for those who are willing to be open-minded and who want to learn and change to be better. Now, don't get me wrong. I am an only child and I'm hard-headed and I want things my way. Everyone who knows me knows this about me, but I am so introspective constantly all the time when it comes to how I teach, the effect that I have on my students, the impact that I have on my school and my colleagues. This is always running through my mind and it helps me become a better teacher and to refine my practice. Never has there been a point when I felt like I have it down. I'm constantly trying to improve. And this is what will help you become an amazing teacher. So you have to be someone who's coachable, someone who has an open mind, and someone who's willing to admit that you're wrong sometimes. Now, this includes also being willing to be observed and to have someone critique your teaching. Now, this is something that I feel I don't get enough of. And luckily, this year is my observation year. Because I, I don't feel like I get observed enough. I don't feel like I get feedback enough. And how else am I going to grow if I'm just in my own bubble and in my own thinking? So I think it's important to give yourselves opportunity to get that feedback and to welcome it. Don't get defensive when someone wants to come in and observe you. I would actually welcome it and be flattered that they want to take the time to see what you're doing in your class. Finally, when it comes to things like late work policies, behavior policies, who is responsible for the learning, your views on students' ability to learn, how you run your classroom, all of these things, I want you to sit and take a good look at your philosophy of teaching and how the way that you're going to run your classroom serves students. 
And the reason why I bring this up is because sometimes, well, a lot of times you're going to find that teachers' policies are kind of weird and convoluted, and they don't necessarily point to student learning and achievement, especially when it comes to grading and things like bathroom policies where they get tickets for three times a semester. Now, I know that this is to curb bathroom use for frequent flyers, but is there a better way than having them have to use a ticket system in order to go to the restroom? I personally don't have a problem with students going to the bathroom and other teachers say, well, they're going to abuse it and they're not really going to the bathroom and they're going to walk around. But in my mind, if a student feels the need to get up and get some air so that they can clear their mind, I'm actually fine with that because they come back and they're ready to focus again. It happens just about every single time. In fact, when I have a student falling asleep in my classroom, I have them get up and go get a drink of water, even if they're not thirsty, even if they didn't ask to leave the classroom. I want them to go and wake themselves up so that they can come back and learn. The biggest thing that I want for my students is to learn and to grow and feel respected and welcome in my classroom. I don't need to punish them or humiliate them or make them know that I'm boss because they know that I'm in charge of the classroom, but this classroom is our classroom. And guys, when you have that buy-in, they will do whatever you ask them to. They will write a five-paragraph essay They'll put their heads down and they will write it without any complaints or any resistance. I promise you. So just to recap, I asked you, are you a blamer? Do you have thick skin? Do you like the sound of kids' voices more than your own? When was the last time someone changed your mind? And finally, do your educational policies and philosophies truly serve students and learning. So I know I've given you a lot to think about and to consider, and I don't want you to feel like I want fewer teachers in the classroom or that I'm trying to be a Debbie Downer here. But teaching is not for the faint of heart, no matter how rewarding it is. And I love teaching, and I can't imagine doing anything else. But it's physical, and you have these microaggressions that you experience all throughout your day. And they can take the toll on even the most resilient teachers. And I want to be honest with you guys. You know, teaching isn't for everyone, nor should it be. I would hate for you to be 10 or 15 years down the line into your career and realize that you've made a terrible mistake, that teaching isn't right for you. And I've met teachers in this boat and they feel trapped because they're like, oh, I've invested so much and there's nothing else that I can do. And I'm too scared to switch careers and I don't know how to get out. So if you're at the beginning of your career and you're listening to this podcast and you're realizing that what I'm talking about isn't aligning with your personality, with your values, with what you want to do in your life, then maybe take a second to to think about it. Well, maybe more than a second to think about it and reflect on this. And if you want to contact me either through my Facebook group or just email me and you want to talk about it some more, please feel free to do that so that we can see if teaching is right for you. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Teachers Need Teachers podcast. I know it was a bit of a heavy one, especially at the beginning of the school year when there's usually a lot of excitement, but I wanted to kind of have a little bit of a check-in, a reality check, and something for you to think about as your year progresses. And as I had mentioned before, if you want to explore this idea, you can go to my Facebook group, which is teachersneedteachers.com forward slash FB. And if you want the show notes for this episode, you can also go to teachersneedteachers.com forward slash 20. And it's super exciting because this is my 20th episode and I just started in June. And if you do want to get in touch with me so that we can kind of powwow and chat and see what's going on with mindset and what's going on with where you are in terms of teaching, you can email me at kim at teachersneedteachers.com. I hope you have a fabulous day and I really look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for listening to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast. Love this episode? 
head over to Apple Podcast or Google Play to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. 